Does it make sense to you why Python has become the primary, the dominant language for the machine learning community? So packages like uh, PyTorch, TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn, and even like the lower level stuff like NumPy, SciPy, Pandas, mm -hmm. Matplotlib mm -hmm. with the visualization. Can you like, does it make sense to you why it uh, permeated the entire data science, machine learning, AI community? Well, it's part of it is an effect that's as simple as we're all driving on the right side of the road, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, it's compatibility. Yeah. It's it's it, and 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 part of it is uh, not not quite as 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 fundamental as driving on the right side of the road, which you have to do for for safety reasons. I mean, you have to agree on something. Mm -hmm. Every, they they could have picked JavaScript or Perl. There was there was a time in the early two thousands that it really looked like Perl wa was going to dominate like biosciences because DNA search was all based on regular expressions and Perl has the fastest and most comprehensive regular expression engine still does. I spent quite a long time with Perl. That was another mm -hmm. letting go, Let, yeah. letting go of this kind of uh, d data processing uh, system. The reasons why Python became the lingua franca of scientific code and and machine le learning in particular and data science, it really had a lot to do with anything was better than C or C++. <laughs> Recently, a guy who worked at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories in the, the sort of computing division wrote me his 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 memoirs and and he had his his own view of how he helped something he called computational steering into existence mm -hmm. and this was the idea that you you take libraries that in in his days were written in fortran that that solved universal mathematical problems uh, and those libraries still work, but uh, the scientists that use the libraries use them to solve continuously different specific applications and answer different questions. And so those poor scientists were were required to to use, say, Fortran because Fortran was the library the language that the library was written in. And then the scientist would have to write an application that sort of uses the library to solve a particular equation or set of, of answer a set of questions. And the same for, same for C++, because a, a, and there's, there's interoperability. So the dusty decks are written either in C++ or Fortran. Uh, and so Paul Dubois was one of the people who I think in the mid '90s, saw that that you needed a higher level language for the scientists to to sort of tie together mm -hmm. the fundamental mathematical algorithms of linear algebra and and other stuff. And so, gradually, some libraries started appearing that did very fundamental stuff with arrays of numbers in Python. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I first created Python, I was not expecting it to be used for arrays of numbers much. I thought that was like an outdated data type and everything was like objects and strings and like Python was good and fast at string manipulation and objects, obviously, but arrays of numbers were not very efficient and the multidimensional arrays didn't even exist in the language at all. Uh, but there were people who realized that Python had extensibility that was flexible enough that they could write third-party packages that did support large arrays of numbers and operations on them very efficiently. And somehow they got a foothold through sort of different parts of the scientific community. I, I remember that the Hubble Space Telescope people in Baltimore were somehow big Python fans in the late 90s. 
And at various points, small improvements were made and more people got in touch with using Python to derive these libraries of interesting uh, algorithms. And like once, once you have a bunch of scientists who are working on similar problems, say they're all working on stuff that that come data that comes in from the Hubble Space Telescope, but they're looking at different things. Some some are looking at stars in this galaxy, other are looking at galaxies. The math is completely different, but the mm -hmm. the underlying libraries are still the same. And so they exchange code. They say, well, I wrote this Python program or I wrote a Python library to solve this class of problems. And the other guys either say, oh, I can use that library too, or if you make a few changes, I can use that library too. Why, write, why start from scratch in Perl or JavaScript where there's not that infrastructure uh, for arrays of numbers yet, whereas in Python you have it. And so more and more scientists at different places doing different, different work discovered Python and then then people who had an idea for an important new fundamental library decided, oh, Python is, is actually already known to our users, so let's use Python as the user interface. I think that's how Tensor, I imagine at least, that's how TensorFlow ended up with Python as the user interflow, interface. Right, but with TensorFlow, there's a deeper, history of what the community is. So it's not just like what packages it needs, it's like what the community leans on for a programming language. Because TensorFlow uh, had a prior library that was internal to Google, but there was also competing machine learning frameworks like Theano, Cafe, that were in Python. There was some Scala, um, some other languages, but Python was really dominating it. And it's interesting because um, there's other languages from the engineering space, like MATLAB, that a lot of people used, but different design choices by the company, by the core developers, led to it not spreading. And one of the choices with MATLAB uh, by MathWorks is to not make it open source, right? Or yep. not you know, having people pay. It was a very expensive product, and so, uh, universities especially disliked it because it was a price per seat, I, I remember hearing. Yeah, but I think that's not why it failed or it failed to spread. I think the universities didn't like it, but they would still pay for it. The thing is, it didn't uh, feed into that GitHub open source uh, packages culture. Mm -hmm. So like, and that's somehow a precondition for... Um, for viral spreading, the hacker culture, like the tinkerer culture. Uh, with, with Python, it feels like you can build a package from scratch or solve a particular problem and get excited about sharing that package with others. And that creates an excitement about a language. I tend to like Python's approach to open source in particular because it's sort of, it's almost egalitarian. Uh, there's, there's little hierarchy there's, there's obviously some because like you all need to decide whether you drive on the left or the right side of the road sometimes. But there is a lot of access for people with little power. You don't have to work for a big tech company to make a difference in the Python world. Uh, we have affordable events that really care about community and support people. And sort of the community is... is is like a big deal at our conferences and mm -hmm. in, in the PSF. When the PSF funds events, it's always about growing the community. The PSF funds very little development. They that they do some, but most of the develop most of the money that the PSF forks out uh, is to community fostering things. 